OMG, look at us. Didn't see you there. <laughs> Just hanging out next to uh, Morningside Park here. Today I'm gonna be doing a little tour of a great neighbor here in North Manhattan called Morningside Heights. This neighborhood was actually chosen by my Patreon people, huh? If you haven't checked it out, please check out my Patreon. It really helps me to do all this stuff. Also to subscribe and like the video already. If you haven't seen these videos, you're in for a treat. You're not gonna find videos that give you this much information anywhere on YouTube, believe me, I've looked. That being said, we're gonna start this tour here in a second. Um, nice day, not too cold. I can uh, open the jacket up, let it breathe a little bit, let this shirt that my mom gave me for Christmas breathe a little bit. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Phil, what do you think? Should we start this tour? Yeah, let's get started. Phil's back, baby. He, w he wasn't on my last video, he was in Sag Harbor. Uh, not making enough on Patreon yet to take Phil to Sag Harbor with me, but uh, <laughs> one of these days. <laughs> Anyways, we're going to start this tour, Morningside Heights, great neighborhood. You guys ready to do this? Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. So we're at 110th and Manhattan Avenue here. This is at the north end of Manhattan, northwest end of Manhattan, right above the park. We're in Morningside Heights, but a lot of history, famous for having Columbia University in it. And we're walking right by, actually, the park. This right here is Morningside Park. You can see here to the right. Morningside Park actually dates back to 1895. Uh, this is kind of like the heart of the neighborhood. There's a lot of Columbia students come here to run, people come here to hang out. But it dates back to 1895. So in the 1860s, they were expanding the grid of Manhattan, which I've talked about in a billion videos. It's one of the most important things in New York that was implemented in 1811, but they were expanding it here at the north end of Manhattan in the 1860s. And a very important man in New York City history named Andrew Haswell Green pushed to create this as a park because it was so rocky. There's tons and tons of Manhattan schist here. <laughs> Pause for all the laughter, you immature kids who are thinking, oh, look at the pile of schist, oh, look at this schist, we're walking all over schist, okay, we get it. But he pushed to make this into a park because it was so rocky and difficult to build on that it would make more sense to make it as a park. So, in the 1870s, plans start being submitted. In fact, Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox submit a plan uh, in 1870s, it's actually rejected. Eventually, Jacob Ray Mould, who was one of their assistants for Central Park, actually, takes over and he starts building it. Eventually, he dies, though, unfortunately. And Calvert Vox actually takes the helm. But guess what? He dies in 1895. This is kind of a crazy story in New York. Calvert Vox, one of the most famous landscape architects in the United States, died mysteriously when he left to go for his daily walk from his son's house in uh, Bath Beach over in uh, Brooklyn. And he just disappeared. Everyone's like, where'd he go? Where'd he go? They found his body in the water the next day. Mysteriously drowned. Ooh, scandalous. Andrew Haswell Green actually died in mysterious circumstances too. This is crazy. So in 1903, Andrew Haswell Green gets shot by a guy at his apartment complex, just outside of his apartment. His name was Cornelius Williams. He shot him to death. Why? Because he mistaked him for someone else. This guy was a tenant of a woman named Hannah Elias, who was this woman, a very famous black woman, who actually became famous for, uh, she, was, she had a very famous John, I guess, named John Platt, who was very rich and gave her money to start real estate. And with that, she actually became kind of a real estate mogul, not mogul, but you know what I mean, she had money. And one of her tenants wanted to shoot that rich guy and mistakes Haswell Green for that rich guy. Crazy. Right now we're walking west towards the water. Uh, people like, let's see, the people who've lived here or are from here, George Carlin, Harry Houdini, Thurgood Marshall, F. Scott Fitzgerald lived here for a bit. Uh, it's got a lot of history. It's a really cool neighborhood. It wasn't developed until fairly recently. I'm talking like late 1800s even at all. Uh, but what really pushed this neighborhood to be developed was the subway in the early 1900s. 1904 was the first line of the subway. It really connected this area of Manhattan to the rest of the city. Um, it's a big deal. We talked about this in my Washington Heights video uh, because that was another neighborhood that didn't get developed until uh, the subway as well. Uh, I don't even need to say it anymore. So we're gonna keep walking. I'm gonna show you also too, there's lots of cool churches here. Uh, a lot of history with that. And also, of course, Columbia University, which moved here in 1897. I'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, but this whole area, like I said, was undeveloped. It was actually granted to New York City. It was given to New York City in the late 1600s. It passed through a couple hands. In fact, one Dutch guy, his name's Randewater, uh, gave it the name Vrandewater Heights in the 1700s. He owned it for like 50 years. Passed through multiple hands. 
Uh, and then it was, like I said, in the late 1800s, well, first of all, in the mid 1800s, it actually housed the Bloomingdale Asylum was open here in the 1820s. And then in the 1830s, a large orphan asylum was opened here. And this kind of gave this neighborhood a different reputation, obviously. People would come here uh, to visit their loved ones uh, and all that stuff. But it was pretty much just the asylums that, that kind of held sway here. Anywho, those asylums leave in the late 1800s. Uh, 1889, I believe, the, uh, the Bloomingdale Asylum moved north of the city. And uh, the, the orphan asylum also left around then. In fact, Bloomingdale Asylum was named too. Uh, was given a Bloomingdale Road, which was a road that led out here, extend, an extension pretty much of Broadway uh, to connect this area of town. We start seeing here the building here. I'm passing in front of you, Phil. Look at that. We're seamless. Don't lose me. Are we done? I can never lose you. Bro. How are we doing? Let me see something real quick. Cool. Just making sure. How are we doing, Phil? Great, man. Everything's good with you? Yeah, we're making, we're making some quality content, as the, as the kids call it. Content. That's what everything is now. It's just content. Fill my time. I don't, I don't like to call this content. I like to call them videos. I like to call them, you know, connections with people. Unbelievable content. How about value? This is value. Come on. Thank you. All right, we're going to take a right here on Amsterdam, and we're going to walk by this amazing church here in a second. This neighborhood also has lately been developed more. You have, the, you have the students, obviously, here, but you also have young families. They've tried to develop this neighborhood uh, through what we, we've called gentrification. <gasps> <gasps> Can't say that word too much, huh? People are going to pop out of a trash can and say something about it. But it's been uh, changed here. In fact, they tried to name it Soha, South Harlem, Soha. It's ridiculous. Also, too, here to the left, you have the Hungarian pastry shop. It's a really cool little uh, pastry shop, if you can't tell. It was actually opened in the 1960s, early 1960s, by this Hungarian couple. It was taken over in the 70s by a family, a Greek family, I believe, who still own it today. Really good pastries, though. I always used to go there. I used to give tours a lot of this area. Uh, sometimes they would be bus tours. I'd have to give bus tours a lot of times for Australian people who were just coming back from Vegas, and they'd always be hung over and barely paying attention. And I'm like, don't you people know what I'm giving you right now? This is gold. And they would barely be awake in the bus. This is really cool. Check this out, Phil. Yeah, isn't that nice? That right there is the, it's called the Peace Fountain. It was built by Greg Wyatt in 1985. A lot of symbolism there. The crab arms is supposed to kind of harken to the origin of humanity, which is origin of all life, which is the oceans and the water. You have a DNA helixes. It's like the triumph of good over evil. Pretty cool. And then here, thank you, I know, I'm really, uh, I know, very, very deep. I should be a professor at Columbia, huh? Here to the right, you have uh, St. John the Divine, but you also have, before that, the Cathedral School. This is the Cathedral School. This is K through 8. It's a school that's associated with St. John the Divine. Uh, a pretty good school. In fact, Ben Stiller went there. Ah. Yeah, as did Burgess Meredith. Ah. You know who he is, Phil? He's the, he was the Mickey in the Rocky movies. Go get him, Rock! That was a good impression, right? You're a bum! So here is St. John the Divine. This is awesome. I love this church. This is one of the biggest cathedrals in the world. Fortunately, they're not going to let us in with, with cameras. So I'll talk to you from out here, but may I'll show you some pictures. I'll sneak one in and get you some good B-roll. These doors are each three tons, which is pretty cool, but the inside is gigantic. There's actually an area with a dome that you could fit the Statue of Liberty under without the pedestal. It's so big. Uh, also, too, at the end, you have all these different altars created by different fa uh, artists, famous artists. One is Keith Haring. Now, think about that. This is a church that allowed a gay artist to create an altar for it. That's a pretty progressive thing to do. In, uh, and he died in 1990. You also have uh, Carrer and Hastings, the ones who designed the, the New York Public Library. They created an altar, as did uh, Gutzon Borglum. He, cre he helped create an altar there. Uh, he's the guy who did Mount Rushmore. Pretty cool, huh? A lot of stuff there. This building, too, also is still under construction, pretty much. Uh, you can see up there, oh, I'll get the B-roll. Don't try to don't try to pan up there, Phil. All right, we're going to mess everything up. But the, up there, you can see one of the towers is done, the other one isn't. It was started in 1892. It's still not finished. There were multiple reasons why it stopped, including World War II, uh, budget problems, etc. cetera. Uh, but lots of famous stuff has happened here. Uh, uh, James Gandolfini had his funeral here. Nikola Tesla, Tony Morrison, um, Jim Henson. When Jim Henson died, actually, it was a really sad, holy Lord, if you guys want to really, you want, just want to, you want a tearjerker, go look up Jim Henson's funeral at this place. 
there's a part where J Big Bird comes out and he sings, it's not easy being green. His voice is cracking and everything, it's a mess. Good Lord. Anyways, it's really sad. It's not easy being green. You know that song, Phil? Yeah. Do you really? Yeah. Oh, okay, that's cool. I thought, I thought Kermit sang it. He did, but he sang it. You're right, good, nice work, Phil. That was very impressive. But yeah, you're right, Kermit did sing it and he, uh, he sang it uh, in, in like, I guess in honor of Jim Henson. Yeah, yeah. And over here to the right, you're gonna see what's called the 113th Gatehouse. That's 113th Street. But that's the gatehouse that was created for the Croton Aqueduct. Now this is a very, very important point of New York. A lot of people don't realize what this is. So the Croton Aqueduct, I'm gonna get on this side, Phil. Look at this, we're switching, we're seamless. We've been doing this a long time, people. Don't try this at home. Uh, also too, yeah, I have my mask on. I'm gonna put it on when we go through the college and I'm around more people and everything, but I got the antibodies, baby. I just got tested yesterday. Uh, still got them, still got them. Um, anyways, uh, the Croton Aqueduct, I was saying. 1842, this Croton Aqueduct brings water from upstate into New York City. This is the first time New York City had clean drinking water in its history. Before this, it was complete chaos. There was yellow fever epidemics, all kinds of disgusting sh stuff, all kinds of disgusting schist, <laughs> all kinds of disgusting schist going on. So uh, it was a big, big deal when this opened in 1842. The city rejoiced. It was like a huge party. It was insane. Um, that Croton Aqueduct passed through this neighborhood, and that, one that 113th Street gatehouse served the purpose of bringing the water down, helping to bring the water down from this elevated aqueduct down into tubes that then took it to Central Park, where the reservoir was located. There were two big reservoirs. One was in Central Park. It was the receiving reservoir, and then the distributing reservoir was in the spot where the New York Public Library is today. Covered that in my Midtown video. Sick plug, Sick plug baby. <laughs> All right, let's go. We're gonna be walking up Broadway here in a second. Oh, here to the left, Seventh Church of Christ Scientists. Christian science is a religion where they believe in the healing power of prayer and they don't believe in medicine. So they reject medicine. It was, it was, it was actually started in the late 1800s by this woman who came up with the theories but it has since lost credibility. There's still like, there's like 100,000 uh, followers around the world left, not a lot. But uh, yeah, it's gotten a lot of trouble because you know, people are like refusing medicine for like their kids and all kinds of stuff. And yeah, it's, it gets dicey. So we're gonna be walking up Broadway here in a second and heading over towards Columbia University. But once again, I've mentioned this in videos, Broadway, it cuts through all of Manhattan. It's not a, it, and it goes out of Manhattan into the Bronx and leaves the Bronx, goes for like another 100 miles, very important. Uh, street here. I mentioned tons of videos. So don't start telling me that I'm getting repetitive. These are important things. You got to repeat them so you remember them. Okay, there's certain things about New York you got to know. That's one of them. So we're going to go to Broadway, which came over here to the west side. So it goes around the west side of Central Park. It cuts diagonal. This is a cool building. Me and Phil actually did a video here. You got to check out this video. It's really fun. This is Tom's Restaurant here to the right. This is Tom's Restaurant. We're at 112th and Broadway. You see it? Tom's Restaurant is the diner from Seinfeld. So in the TV show Seinfeld, this is the establishing shot for Monks. So Monks is the diner they all hang out at. Most of it wasn't shot in New York, but the establishing shot is that restaurant. And what happened was they actually showed up to, in fact, it's opened by my man in my, I can speak, okay? I didn't drink too much coffee. It's owned by a man named Mike Zulis. His family's owned it since the 1940s. And they came and approached him and said, hey man, we want, to, we want to take this picture, is it okay? They made him sign the release. He had no idea it was gonna be as famous of a show. People come from all over the world to eat there just to say they'd, they've shot commercials there. In the video that we did, which by the way, you should watch, it's there. Sick plug, baby, come on. Um, Mike admits he's never even watched Seinfeld before, which is pretty crazy. The owner of the restaurant from Seinfeld has never seen Seinfeld. That church, that's a Broadway Presbyterian church, a church that dates back to the 1820s. And you can start all these buildings too. One of the things that's important to keep in mind is restaurants like Tom's Restaurant are struggling right now. I was speaking with him yesterday, actually he was saying that 90% of his business is gone. And one of the few reasons he's even being able to open is because of Columbia University. Columbia University is their landlord and have cut them a break on their rent. This is Alfred Lerner Hall. We're starting to get to some of the Columbia actual uh, classrooms and, and halls and whatnot. 
This Alfred Lerner was a, uh, he's a New Yorker. His parents owned a candy shop in Brooklyn, or in Queens, uh, he's from Brooklyn, one of those two. But he owned, the, he owned the Cleveland Browns. He owned the Cleveland Browns when he was alive. You guys know the Cleveland Browns? The Cleveland Browns are to football what Columbia University is to football. They're not good at it. All right, I'm gonna put this on. We're gonna walk through the campus of Columbia. Let's do it. You been here before, Phil? Yeah, I have actually. I've uh, done a lot of catering. Oh yeah? <laughs> That's interesting. Catering, huh? Yeah. Well, uh, never but, uh, a lot of catering. So the story behind this is Columbia University was founded in uh, 1757. It was given a charter by King George II. This is when New York was still a um, British colony. And after the Revolutionary War, they changed their name to Columbia University because Columbia was another name for the Americas, pretty much. And they wanted to break from any British traditions and things like that. But this is a very famous school. It's probably the best school in New York City. Uh, it's an Ivy League school. We talked about Ivy League schools in my Roosevelt Island video. Man, we are plugging away. Might not be good. Might need to slow down. But because uh, there's a Cornell campus in Roosevelt Island, but. Ivy League basically means it's old and it's very good, not to get in that whole thing again. But uh, tons and tons of like famous alumni, uh, Barack Obama, uh, who else? Eric Holder, um, Alexander Hamilton, um, and uh, Julia Stiles. <laughs> yeah, she's not really Alexander Hamilton, but she was a pretty good actress. Lots of movies have shot here too. Uh, let's see, Ghostbusters. Um, Marathon Man, what else? Spider-Man, huh? Yeah. Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Uh, I'll take this opportunity to say they make way too many superhero movies, but uh, they did shoot here. And also uh, the best movie, arguably the best movie ever made in history, uh, New York Minute starring the Olsen twins. <laughs> More yes, less, Spider -Man. less le exactly, <laughs> exactly, less. Less superhero movies, more Olsen twin movies. Just wanted to show you these before we head out this way. This over here is Butler Hall. This is a pretty cool building, obviously. Uh, you see all the names of the famous um, thinkers in history. Uh, you know, Homer, Herodotus, Sophocles, Plato, Aristotle. You can read, it's up there. And then over here to the left, you have the Low Library. This is pretty cool. So this whole campus was designed by uh, McKim Mead and White, which is a famous architectural firm. In fact, Charles Fullen McKim, I think, took the helm of this campus. Uh, but a really beautiful uh, library here. You can see the statue there. That's uh, Alma Mater. That's Alma Mater, which is uh, Latin for nourishing mother, because it nourishes you with education. Ah, look at that. Let's all get educated. But it's also kind of cool is the Alma Mater statue was designed by Daniel Chester French, who designed the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, and there's an actual uh, little legend that if you find an owl that Daniel Chester French carved into the robe of alma mater and you're the first freshman to do it, you're going to end up being the valedictorian of the school. I'm going to do it, baby. I went to the Columbia of uh, North Central Florida. You might have heard of it. University of Florida. Yeah, no big deal. So now we're walking out of the campus and we're gonna walk north, continue walking north on Broadway. You have Pulitzer Hall over here. Pulitzer Hall named after Joseph Pulitzer. We've talked about him in lots of videos as well. Uh, I, I should probably stop plugging, huh? I should probably stop plugging. We've already made like four plugs. I need to take it easy. Self-promotion's hard though, Phil. How am I gonna get people to watch these videos? Anyways, the uh, Pulitzer Hall over here named after Josip Pulitzer, a Hungarian immigrant. He came over here at 17 years old. He pulled himself up, he, he, he bought his own newspaper, the New York World made a fortune, and then gave lots of money to different places. Uh, he helped fund the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. He helped fund a uh, fountain, very famous fountain, the Pulitzer Fountain, which we covered in the Midtown uh, Fifth Avenue video. Uh, also, too, he, uh, he also funds the, or funded the Pulitzer Prize given out here at Columbia every year for excellence in journalism and uh, literature. In fact, Columbia University has graduated or had as teachers 125 different uh, Pulitzer Prize winners. Pretty cool. 
here to the left is Barnard College. Now, Barnard College is an all-women's school. Now, just to give you an idea, Columbia University is like, whoa, take it easy, Phil. You trip? You're tripping over now. Uh-oh. I don't want you to sue me. Okay. So, Columbia University is about 33,000 students, um, and it actually has, uh, you know, like, I think it's like 24,000 grad students, humongous grad program. Um, and like 9,000 undergrad, but Barnard is a college, a liberal arts college, only for women. And it's got like 2,600 students, but they're all female. Columbia University was actually only for men until 1983, which is kind of crazy. But what happened was in 1883, um, they started to propose the idea of having a women's, uh, women allowing women into the school, but I don't think they were ready for it. The president was named Barnard at the time. He wanted women in the school. Uh, but instead, they created this syllabus for uh, women through the school where they could kind of learn on their own and be given a degree. And one of the graduates of that, her name was Meyer, uh, in 1889 pushed to create the school. Uh, so it was created and given the name Barnard for that guy. Uh, some of the alumni are like Cynthia Nixon. So kind of interesting. Over here to the right, you have the, what I was talking about before. This is the plaque. See that? Yeah, we get it, you're driving a truck. That plaque right there is the uh, plaque commemorating the Battle of Harlem Heights. So September 16th, 1776, um, I've talked about the Battle of Long Island before. That's where basically George Washington is chased out of New York City, uh, but it happened down in Brooklyn. Uh, and he had to cross in the middle of the night to escape. And then he basically begins his retreat out of the city. Here, he actually won a battle. What happened was his reconnaissance team, known as Knowlton's Rangers, kind of came to the south. He was up north in what's today Washington Heights. They came down north to kind of scope out everything and they encountered some British troops. Uh, they begin fighting and it's like this back and forth. Uh, and eventually Washington's troops, which he had more of at that time, kind of flanked them and they were able to cause the British troops to retreat. It was a victory for Washington uh, in basically a, over, it was a victory in a battle in a lost kind of fight for New York City, but it, it boosted the morale and it gave him a win before he left and allowed them to leave with a little more pride. It's a big important point. Thomas Nolan was the guy on that, on that plaque that was lying there dying because he died in the process. Some interesting history, right? How about this for some extra history on that? Nathaniel Green was actually involved in that battle. He's the guy who they named Green Street in Soho after, the guy who Fort Green is named after. All these buildings that we're walking around, by the way, are owned pretty much by Columbia. Columbia is the biggest landowner in this area, and they rent out, they serve as the landlords. And I also want to, I can't emphasize enough how, how big and important Columbia is to the history of, of New York and to the United States. It's a little dark here, Phil, sorry. But uh, some of the famous alumni, John Jay as well, Rogers and Hammerstein, and my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> Okay. To the right here, you're going to have the Teachers College, the Horace Mann Teachers College. Horace Mann was a legislator. He was a U.S. rep, huge education reformer. But the Teachers Co College, um, but one of the alumni there, Art Garfunkel. Art Garfunkel got a master's and a Ph.D., I believe, in mathematics teaching from the Teachers College here. You guys know who Art Garfunkel, Simon Garfunkel. He taught math teaching. I don't know about you guys, but if I was learning math teaching, I would immediately be homeward bound, I'll tell you that. It's a pretty good joke, right, Phil? Pretty solid. Thanks. He has another song, Homeward Bound. You guys know Simon Garfield when they sing like Sounds of Silence? Hello darkness, my old friend, I've come to talk with you again, because a vision softly creeping. Oh my god. <laughs> that's, a way to, that's a way to get sounds of silence interrupted. <laughs> now here, in front of me, you have Union Theological Seminary. So this started in the 1820s as well. Let's go, Phil, we can make this. So the Union Theological Seminary is the oldest independent seminary in the United States. It was opened in 1836. Some of the famous uh, teachers or alumnus from there, well, teachers actually, Cornell West started here. You guys know who Cornell West is? Um, also, uh, Paul Tillich in the 1960s, 1950s, very famous theologian. 
Uh, and recently, I, I think a professor now is Michelle Alexander. She teaches here now. She wrote uh, The New Jim Crow, a very popular book. Uh, great book, by the way, a little recommendation. Uh, and here to the right, which we'll come up to in a second, also too, right near here, you have where Juilliard started. Juilliard is now located at Lincoln Center, but it started right here where the Manhattan School of Music is today. And you also have here the Jewish Theological Seminary, which is kind of the center of uh, conservative Judaism in the United States, pretty much. Conservative Judaism is kind of one of the branches of Judaism today, one of the modern branches of Judaism. And then here, you have this building, which we'll talk about when we get in front of it. But this building, well, we'll talk about it right now. Why not? This building is the uh, Riverside Church. The Riverside Church was built in 1927, and it's here right next to the Hudson River and Riverside Park, which is where it gets the name. And the people who built it were the Rockefellers. The Rockefellers, in fact, John D. Rockefeller Jr. built this Carillon, which is the bell tower. It's like 392 feet, it's humongous. It's built like a skyscraper for his mother. That uh, tower has 74 different bells. And one of them is a 20-ton bell. But this church is famous for its progressive speakers who uh, have passed through. It's hosted Nelson Mandela, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., Noam Chomsky, uh, people like that. And in fact, on April 4th, 1967, it hosted Martin Luther King Jr. for his Riverside, what they call now the Riverside Church speech, one of his most important speeches, because it was the first speech that he did that came out against the Vietnam War, very passionately and publicly. And a lot of people say that that was kind of the beginning of the end for him. He became kind of a marked man. It was like the establishment or whoever would accept his rhetoric as long as it didn't deal with kind of the big issues that the country was in, the military industrial complex, economics, what have you. But it was done here at this church, the Riverside Church speech, big deal. It was called Beyond Vietnam. You should look it up, good speech. And then here to the right or to the left, this is all Riverside Park too. Riverside Park is like four and a half miles. It stretches up and down, I guess, the, the, the side of the river. Uh, it's been added onto over time. They've added acres as recently as 2000, the year 2000. But great views, all kinds of things you can do down there. Uh, the original one was actually designed partly by Frederick Law Olmsted, who was one of the Central Park designers. It's crazy how back then people designed everything for the city. And then here, where we're gonna end the tour shortly, sadly, you have Grant's tomb, famous Grant's tomb. If you guys know who Ulysses S. Grant is, this is where the old riddle is, who's buried in Grant's tomb? Who's buried in Grant's tomb, Phil? Uh, Grant? No, no one's, <laughs> no one's buried here because he's actually in a mausoleum above ground. Gotcha. So this was built in 1897. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant, famous uh, uh, Civil War hero who also was president of the United States, had kind of like a tainted, uh, kind of controversial presidency, but he's buried here. And the reason is because uh, he was very exalted because the Civil War uh, kept the country together, uh, but he wasn't buried in a military cemetery because they didn't allow women at the time. And as he wanted, he had said expressly, he wanted to be buried with his wife. So they buried him here. We also talked about earlier Columbia, Columbia giving a lot of the tenants breaks and things, Tom's Restaurant, which by the way is also where the song uh, Tom's Diner was written by uh, Suzanne Vega. She was a student here and uh, she wrote the song Tom's Restaurant. Do you know that song, Phil? That's the song that goes You know that one? Come on, that was good singing. All right, well, we're here at the end. This is Grant's tomb. Unfortunately, we can't go inside. We saw a lot today. It's really cool neighborhood. Pretty small. It's not a not a huge uh, neighborhood. It's kind of like a neighborhood of a neighborhood, really, uh, here in the south of Harlem. Uh, but lots of cool history here: churches, uh, religion, education, uh, and it's and it's also you know kind of diverse. It wasn't developed till fairly recently. You have beautiful views here of the uh, river, the Hudson River, named after Henry Hudson. I can go into that whole thing, but I did a video on him. I won't even say it because, uh, you know, I think I've been doing it too much this tour. But uh, yeah, this is one of the many cool neighborhoods and you Patreon people are responsible for picking this one. I like this neighborhood a lot. So thank you guys for picking it. Uh, that being said, if you guys want to <laughs> support Patreon, please check it out. Try and expand this thing, trying to grow this thing, trying to go all over the world, baby. Gotta be the next Anthony Bourdain's. <laughs> and do it everywhere. Talk about everything. But uh, yeah, that'd be great. Please check out my Patreon. 
also too. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Phil, did I miss anything? As far as I know, uh, no. No? But I know nothing about history. So. <laughs> That's right, you don't. You're from, New Phil's from New Jersey over there. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful neighborhood. One of the many beautiful neighborhoods in Manhattan with its own rich history, all these different institutions that each have their own rich history. It's incredible to me how each building, each block of New York City has so much history, so much, uh, so many stories. Uh, and you know, that's all I'm trying to do here. So uh, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. We're gonna, we're gonna kind of end the tour here and uh, yeah, see y'all later.